All right then, good evening, um, well evening in London, uh, I think different times when the various locations that you guys are joining from today. Uh, welcome to the next in our series of lockdown webinars. Um, my name is Julia Lambeth, I'm one of the educators at WCT School London uh, and this evening I'm going to be talking to you about Sauvignon Blanc. So uh, for people that have been joining our webinars for a while, you may have seen some of our other variety and focus uh, series, I think I can call it. So we've talked about um, some of the other international varieties, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, Riesling, Chenin Blanc. Um, so tonight is the turn of the lovely Sauvignon. So I can see that several of you are drinking some Sauvignon as you are watching this. So I do hope that you enjoy it if you feel like popping in a little tasting note into the chat later on, do feel free to. Um, so starting from the beginning with Sauvignon Blanc, um, just wanted to have a little overall introduction to it, have a think about um, some general descriptions. And the first thing that comes to my mind when I talk about Sauvignon Blanc, and I don't know if it will be the same with you, is that it's just a very popular grape variety. Um, it's, it's been popular for many years. It's been popular ever since I started in the wine trade. Um, and it, it looks like that popularity is not diminishing. Um, and when I say popular, I mean that it's, um, it's widely sold, widely planted, consumers enjoy it. Um, in terms of the UK market in particular, a YouGov poll that was done last year revealed that it's the most popular style of wine among UK drinkers. Um, I should clarify that with style of wine there, it was talking about sort of dry, refreshing white wines. So it's not just Sauvignon Blanc that was in that category. Um, it was encompassed with other varieties like Pinot Grigio and whatnot. Um, but I still think that's, um, that's a pretty impressive sign. Um, Sauvignon Blanc seemed to really um, reach its popularity in the 80s and 90s. Uh, it came about sort of after the age of Chardonnay. Uh, Chardonnay was uh, very popular for a long time, uh, particularly those oaky Chardonnays. Um, and then it seemed there was a bit of a, a shift in attitudes. People uh, wanted something that had a little bit more freshness to it, a little bit more lightness to it. And Sauvignon Blanc provided that. And typically, uh, it doesn't see much oak aging. So it was a real contrast with its kind of fresh, herbaceous, aromatic characteristics that people uh, really enjoyed and have continued to enjoy ever since. Um, it's an interesting one because I think in the wine trade sometimes it gets a little bit overlooked. Maybe it's not seen as having the same complexity as some other varieties. Typically it doesn't have the same aging potential as other varieties, which may also be a reason so I think often it gets a bit sort of maybe put to the side, oh, you know, Sauvignon Blanc, yeah, sure. Um, but it is a variety that has a lot of potential, makes lots of very high quality wines. Um, and I put their very expressive wines as well. So I saw in the chat earlier, some of you were uh, tasting some wines from Sancerre. Uh, and I think many would agree that Sancerre the Sauvignon Blanc in Sunset does have an expressiveness. It has a quality to it that you don't get from Sunset grown in other places. Likewise, Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand has a more distinct characteristic to it, a greater vibrancy to it. That means that when you taste a, white, a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, it, it gives you that sense of place. So, yeah, it, it's got a lot going for it. And then at the bottom, I've put capable of a variety of styles. Um, so for Sauvignon Blanc, I think we would mostly associate Sauvignon Blanc with um, wines that are dry, unoaked, have a, a variety of herbaceous flavours that can be quite delicate, uh, whereas it can do other things as well. We'll talk later about Sauvignon Blanc that, that is oak aged. There are several places that are making oak aged Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, we can also get sweet wines made from Sauvignon Blanc as well. Uh, you can even get sparkling wines made from Sauvignon Blanc too. So 
it's, it's got a few, few little tricks up its sleeve, if you like. Um, so maybe it deserves a little bit more respect, perhaps, for its um, variety than, than what it's sometimes given. So let's just have a little think about some of the characteristics of Sauvignon Blanc as a grape variety. So it is a grape that's suited to cool or moderate climates. Um, and this is because if you do grow it anywhere that's, that's warm, it can lose its delicate herbaceous characteristics. Those grassy green pepper notes that are one of the things that many people look for in a Sauvignon Blanc um, will, will just fade away. So it can end up being more simple. But if you stick to somewhere that is more cool or moderate, then you retain those vibrant characteristics. Um, so when we look at some of the countries around the world later where it's produced, we'll think about some of our um, warmer climate countries. Uh, it has taken a bit of time to get the right combination of location uh, for Sauvignon Blanc. It needs to be somewhere that is more moderate, that has some sort of moderating influence that means that it's allowed to ripen more slowly and maintain these, this variety of characteristics. It is also a vigorous grape variety. Um, so vigorous, here we're thinking about a lot of um, leaf growth. Uh, so this can have a negative impact on the um, fruit ripening. So it's not necessarily seen, uh, it's not really seen as a good thing. So it's um, one of the characteristics of the variety that does have to be managed. But there's a few different ways we can do that. Uh, planting on poor soils is one way. Um, if you've done much study with this, you'll know uh, probably that in general, when we talk about growing grapes, uh, we often don't put them on soils that are too fertile uh, because this can encourage more vigorous growth in, in many varieties. So often we're thinking about poorer soils with, with just enough access to nutrients that the vine can survive. Other options for Sauvignon Blanc can be things like the rootstocks. Uh, so you'll know that many vines these days are grafted. Uh, often when we talk about grafting, we talk about it in the context of phylloxera, but there are many, many reasons why you may use different rootstocks um, for your grape variety. Uh, it could be to do with other pests, it could be to do with soil types. Um, and here with Sauvignon Blanc, it might be to do um, with just controlling that vigor a little bit better. Uh, and then the other option is pruning. You know, if you just cut, cut some of that growth back, uh, it's a little bit more manual, but that's also gonna have the desired effect. Um, and the last point down there is that it's susceptible to a couple of vineyard diseases. So powdery mildew and black rot are, um, are not things that you want on your grapes. Um, if the grapes do get affected by them, it means that they, uh, they would have to be discarded. You won't be able to use them. And so the point there on irregular, irregular yields just means that from year to year, depending on the proportion of your crop that was affected by these diseases would mean that you might have more or less grapes. And then that's going to have an impact overall on the, on the wine that you make, uh, on the amount of wine that you make, of course. So uh, when you're you're trying to run a wine business, you do want things to have um, a, a, as much similarity year to year as possible, so uh, it's not ideal. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, aroma compounds in Sauvignon Blanc. So I've mentioned uh, a couple of times already, uh, and I'm sure I will continue to do so, uh, about the herbaceous characteristics of Sauvignon Blanc. It's an aromatic grape variety. We use the word aromatic to describe wines where they have aromas that are more than fruits. So this could be things like um, green pepper, vegetables, grass or flowers or other things as well. So other grape varieties that are aromatic like um, Riesling or Gewürztraminer or Muscat, there's loads of them. Um, but with Sauvignon Blanc, we can actually sort of dial down into some of the aroma compounds that are present in the grapes to understand where these aromas come from. Um, so often it's to do with the grapes, potentially the yeast, potentially the combination of the two of them. 
Um, and what we can see is that certain, um, certain chemical compounds have associations with particular aromas that we like in Sauvignon Blanc. So you can see here methoxypyrazines are what gives the wine that particular herbaceous characteristic. Uh, often we'll describe green pepper, maybe asparagus, grass, nettles, peas. There's all sorts of things that you might be able to find. Uh, it's the same compound that we find in um, Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc and Carmenere that gives us again those similar uh, green pepper or, um, or grassy characteristics. So it's quite distinctive. Um, and I think it's either something that you love or hate. You know, if you like Sauvignon Blanc, you probably like it because you expect some of these aromas. If you don't like Sauvignon Blanc, it's probably because you're not such a fan of these aromas. Um, and it is something that, you know, is likely to be there in most wines. However, different wines will have different amounts of it. Uh, it's a compound that decreases in the grape with sunlight. So in areas that are more sunny, you're less likely to see these herbaceous characteristics. Um, this does not mean that we won't find them in wines from more sunny climates. Um, what it means is that we'll just have to find more protected areas to grow these grapes or provide a canopy, um, create a canopy that provides greater shade if we want to keep more of these compounds in the final wine. Got a couple of other compounds to mention here as well. So thiols are also quite popular in Sauvignon Blanc. This is what can contribute to the passion fruit or grapefruit or boxwood aromas. Um, now I will admit I copied that from a book. I'm not entirely sure what boxwood smells like, but, but there you go. Some of you will know. Um, uh, so again, this is something that contributes to that kind of intensity of aroma in Sauvignon Blanc. Um, reading an article about this in preparation, um, there was a theory that we get more thiols in Sauvignon Blanc grapes that are machine harvested compared to hand harvested. There'd been a research project um, and this had been the result, but no one could really explain why. So that's why the little question mark at the end. It's something that at the moment, I guess, is more of a correlation, uh, but there'll be an interesting thing to find more about in the future. How does harvesting technique affect aroma compounds in Sauvignon Blanc? Uh, I don't know if there's any uh, potential MW students out there. I'll leave that one down to you. Um, and then the final category of compounds here, we've got the monoterpenes. So this is where we get more of the floral characteristics, the perfume, tropical fruit. Um, this you'll also find in great varieties like Gewürztraminer or Muscat. Um, if you're familiar with those grape varieties, you know that they often do have this more pronounced floral and tropical characteristic. So we find those to a greater extent in those varieties where in Sauvignon Blanc it tends to be to a slightly lesser extent, but does still contribute to the overall style. Um, and it's just a, an interesting thing to consider. It's something that seems to be discussed with Sauvignon Blanc more than some of the other varieties that we've looked at. Um, but there's, there's lots of reading out there if you're interested in understanding more about compounds. Um, I'll, I, can, I can recommend some books at the end if you like. So let's have a, a little think about the history of Sauvignon Blanc. I always like to try and find a little bit about where the grape variety has come from. Um, and normally it's not a very clear picture because uh, they've been around for hundreds of years. Uh, and that's definitely the case with Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, so the origin, where it's from, is debated. Uh, some people figure Bordeaux, other people would say Loire Valley. Um, I'm not sure we're gonna get a clear consensus on that one. Uh, but France, yeah, I think we can all agree on that. Um, evidence for the grape variety goes back to the 16th century, so it has indeed been around for a while. Um, even though, as I've said, its popularity is really only in the last couple of decades. Uh, the name, name Sauvignon Blanc, comes from the word sauvage, meaning wild, um, and the word uh, Blanc meaning white. Um, so apparently it's wild, it looks like a wild vine in terms of how 
its leaves grow. Um, maybe that's connected to the vigor that we talked about previously. Um, <laughs> wild white, I think that's a better name for it actually. Uh, anyway, it has a couple of synonyms. Um, in the Loire Valley, it's also known as Blanc Fumé, um, particularly around Puy Fumé. Uh, and then in California, it was known as Fumé Blanc. So this was a term, uh, term coined by Robert Mondavi in the 1960s. Uh, Fumé Blanc was particularly associated with California, where often it was used for oak age wines. Um, and this has always made sense to me because the word fumé means smoky. We know that with oak we can get smoky flavours, so it's a smoky white wine, it's an oak aged white wine. Um, but then there are also some examples of fumé blanc which are not oak aged. So um, it's a term in my experience that is not quite so widely used now as it was a couple of decades ago, but you can still find it if you go looking for it. Um, and the rest of the information here is largely um, about Sauvignon Blanc's family. Um, in terms of different grape varieties, it seems to have quite a lot of relations. Uh, it is the parent of Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, along with Cabernet Franc. So uh, the theory is that this was a, a natural cross-fertilization that took place in the 18th century in Bordeaux, probably. Um, so Cabernet Sauvignon was created by this uh, cross-fertilization of Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc, which is why it's got part of the two names. Um, and for a lot of people, this seems to increase the standing of Sauvignon Blanc in their reputation. Oh, it created Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, it must be a good grape variety. I don't know why. It's like, I like knowing someone's related to the royal family. Oh, they're, they're more important. I like them more now. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, yeah, parent of Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, potentially a child of Sauvignon, sibling of Chenin Blanc, somehow related to Semillon. So it's, um, it's, yeah, genetically kind of mixed in with quite a few of the other varieties. Um, but despite all that, it, it does have really distinct characteristics. There's not any of these varieties that you'd really um, liken it to in terms of style. Um, and then, as I've mentioned already, its commercial success um, has been much more recent, uh, or its widespread commercial success, should I say. Um, there'll be many people who will argue that the wines from some of the French regions have been popular for many, many years before that. Uh, so I've had a little bit of a mention of wine styles already, but just to come back to that. So most of the time, we're making wines that are dry, um, mostly we're looking at single varietal wines, wines that are unoaked, um, and wines that are designed to be drunk, young and fresh. But then occasionally we will look at wines that are blended. Semillon is a popular blending partner for Sauvignon, which we'll come to when we talk about Bordeaux shortly. And then these wines are often oak aged and then bottle aged. So you can get um, kind of two extreme opposites in terms of style from the grape variety. And I think those oak aged Sauvignon Blancs um, are a really interesting prospect. Um, for the French examples, um, yeah, the Bordeaux examples, often because it's not what you expect. Uh, but then we'll see around the world now, people are experimenting more with different ways of making Sauvignon Blanc. How can we add complexity and texture and richness to this wine? Uh, to make it appealing to a, a wider array of consumers and ensure that it keeps on being uh, popular as the years roll by. Um, and we'll look a little bit more at particular winemaking options in a second. Sweet wines, of course, so it's one of the great varieties that is used in Sautern, uh, one of the more famous sweet wines from around the world. Um, it's normally not the majority of the blend there, um, but it can make sweet wines in its own right. I've had late harvest Sauvignon Blanc, I've had noble rot Sauvignon Blanc in the past, single varietal wines, um, and they do tend to accentuate this sort of tropical characteristic in the wines. Um, and then I've put sparkling question mark, um, largely because this was a thing that I remember seeing a few years ago of, um, of sparkling Sauvignon Blanc 
which often was just force carbonated. So it seemed to come from an idea that people like Sauvignon Blanc, people like sparkling wines, let's make a sparkling Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and they were okay. They were not the most exciting wines in the world. Um, I am sure a few of them exist. And I am actually, I'm sure a few better wines exist as well. Uh, some tank for, uh, method sparkling wine production too, for some better quality examples. Um, but typically it's not gonna be a great variety that's suited to traditional method. Um, once again, because it's about those uh, aromatic characteristics um, that we typically enjoy, which could be a little bit muted um, if you were to put the wine under extended autolysis. Uh, so here, just to go into a little more uh, detail on some winemaking techniques. So as I've said already, it's often single varietal, but can be blended. Uh, we talk about Semillon uh, most commonly as the grape variety that it's blended with, but around the world you'll find all sorts of different varieties will be blended with it. Um, often other aromatic varieties, although I have seen Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay blends, which um, are interesting, quite two different styles there. Um, when it comes to fermentation, we have options for um, wild versus inoculated yeast. Often for the more premium examples, wild yeast will be used and these, these can add more complexity, more, um, more flavours and aromas to the wine. Uh, inoculated yeast will not have the capacity to do that, but will have a more predictable result. Um, so when we're thinking about perhaps the more commercial end of Sauvignon Blanc production, where um, it is a wine made for a certain style at a certain price point in many cases, uh, inoculated yeast can be much more useful here to get the predicted result that we want. Um, in terms of fermentation, typically we'd be looking at um, fermentation in stainless steel, uh, often at a cool temperature. So protective fermentation there is what I mean when we're looking at um, steel used with a limited amount of oxygen exposure. This means, again, that we just keep more of those um, primary characteristics, keep that brighter fruit character. Whereas oxidative fermentation, we'd then be talking about uh, potentially fermentation in oak or elsewise an open top vessel, which would allow more oxygen contact uh, with the wine as it's fermenting. And that's going to create um, a different style. Um, here you might see some more sort of savoury or nutty characteristics develop instead. Um, and as you can imagine, that's, that's quite at odds with the style of Sauvignon Blanc that we've described that most people like so far. So it's not necessarily that common. Um, for maturation, um, again, it can take place in, in steel, where we would then just see that um, the the primary characteristics retained for Sauvignon, steel being an inert vessel, um, but oak is possible. And then we'd end up getting more of those secondary characteristics from the oak, which can add more complexity. Um, there is a concern that oak can uh, overpower the delicate aromas of Sauvignon Blanc. So careful handling here can be quite important. Um, older oak might be used to get um, maybe more kind of texture rather than too much oak flavour and just add that more subtle variation to the wine. Um, the point there that says less contact possible is supposed to say least contact possible. Um, so this is a thing that I think is becoming more common actually in using the leaves, the dead yeast at the end of fermentation leaving those in contact with the with the Sauvignon Blanc for, for an amount of time, just to add more body, more texture to the wine. Uh, and this we'll see in premium wines from a number of different regions. You can find it in uh, France as much as you can find it in New Zealand. Um, but again, it's gonna be more for, for the, the higher quality wines. It's uh, potentially not something we're gonna see on the more commercial inexpensive wines. Uh, and the final point there is that it's drunk young, and I've mentioned this already. Um, Sauvignon Blanc doesn't typically 
develop tertiary characteristics in the way that other grape varieties, other wines will. So when you've got your Sancerre or your Poi Fume or your, I don't know, your Cloudy Bay, whatever you might have, um, it doesn't really benefit the wine to hold on to it for many years. Uh, these wines, especially the high quality wines, can hold for several years. They're not going to rapidly lose their flavours. Uh, you can hold on to them and they will continue to maintain that structure, that intensity, that quality. But it, they're not going to develop new characteristics in the way that many other grape varieties do. So that's why typically drunk young. Um, that said, there are exceptions. Um, again, the, we'll talk about in a second the, the Bordeaux whites, where some of those do have potential for aging, but that's more down to the Semillon in the blend rather than the Sauvignon Blanc. So let's have a little think about Sauvignon Blanc around the world. So I've mentioned a few places already where we can find Sauvignon. Uh, so France, obviously, there's a number of different regions in France where we will find it grown. Um, these days, the, the place you seem to mention after France in terms of Sauvignon Blanc is New Zealand. And this has really been the success story for this variety over the last 30, 40 years. New Zealand will focus a little bit more on in a minute, but it, um, it came from kind of nowhere created this vibrant style of Sauvignon Blanc which developed this international acclaim and demand so just more and more Sauvignon coming out of New Zealand. Um, there are many other places as well you may have some favorite places for Sauvignon Blanc I mean all the kind of normal countries we would talk about uh, in Australia, Chile, Argentina, USA we've mentioned already um, various places in Europe, um, you'll find some in Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, Serbia, Croatia, Romania, other places, Israel, had some Israeli Sauvignon Blanc recently, um, and so on. So, uh, as is the way with any of these great varieties that are commercially very successful, uh, it does tend to be planted in lots of different places. Uh, and you know why wouldn't you because um, you know if you've got something that you know people want to drink then it's it's a good idea to try and make some commercially very important um, so of these regions there's just a few that I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail just have a bit more of a focus on and think about the uh, typical styles that you would find there. Uh, so I'm going to start with France, of course, um, and more specifically the Loire Valley. Uh, so the Loire Valley was um, one of the places that's theorised to be the home of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and for many people would be considered the best place for single varietal expressions of Sauvignon. Um, so particularly when we talk about Sauvignon in the Loire, we're talking about the central vineyard area, looking particularly at Sancerre and Coy Fume, which have been um, really the areas that have the best reputation for this variety for many, many years. They are admired for having a style that's often said to be a little bit more delicate compared to uh, what we'd consider the new world uh, Marlborough style now. So we're still looking at wines that are dry, high in acid, often medium bodied, um, and they will have a combination of some citrus fruit, green fruit, with that herbaceous, pyrazine, grassy characteristic. Um, but they might not be so pungent in terms of that kind of peppery vegetal note. And they will often also have some sort of um, wet stones or smoky or flinty characteristic as well. And this is something that's said to be more of an association with the soils that are here. So 
Throughout Sancerre and Poifume, we have a combination of limestone, but also uh, silex flint soils. Um, and it's, it's just one of those associations where you find Sauvignon Blanc grown on this particular soil, it's said to add this extra dimension to a wine. So earlier when I mentioned expressiveness for Sauvignon Blanc, this is a characteristic that we'll often notice to a greater degree here, rather compared to other Sauvignon Blancs from other places, and that's due to this soil that we find here. Um, so, I mean, terroir is a word that we don't typically use at WSET, um, but it's a word you may be familiar with, where we're thinking about the wine having a sense of place. Um, and I think it's, it's often very true to say that that exists here. Um, and they make very lovely wines, which is, you know, can't complain. Um, historically, we'd be looking at um, wines that don't show particular secondary characteristics. Um, again, styles change over the years. So we're now going to see, we now see more wines um, aiming for riper styles, potentially inspired also by the popularity of the New Zealand wines. Um, and we'll also be seeing wines that do employ some of these other winemaking techniques to add more, more texture and more complexity. Um, outside of Sancerre and Poifume, there is uh, Sauvignon Blanc planted in other places in the Loire Valley. Um, often they don't have the same, quite the same reputation. Um, this may be down to really changes in the soil. You don't necessarily get that same sort of flinty characteristic coming through. Um, but uh, near, near-ish to Sancerre, uh, you can see Menetou Salon on the map there. Um, other places like uh, Rui, Quincy, uh, Terrain is also on the map there. This is a slightly different style of Sauvignon typically. Uh, we're often looking at wines that don't quite have that same complexity or intensity. They're a little bit more on the kind of easier drinking, lower quality side. Fruity, but maybe not quite so complex. But you know, as with all wines, there is a time and a place for that. So here we just have a lovely picture of Sancerre. Um, can't really tell too much about the vineyards or the soils from here, uh, but it's just a nice, nice kind of panoramic shot, I think. Uh, so after the Loire Valley, um, the other place in France we of course have to mention is Bordeaux. Um, as I've said, contended as being the other origin of Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, and here we see more of a variety of styles. So it can be single varietal again, or it can be uh, blended with Semillon can make quite simple wines or very complex wines. Can make dry wines or make sweet wines. Uh, I quite like a region that's full of um, opposites in terms of styles of wine. Uh, so if we break this down a bit, um, we can see that the Entre du Mer region um, in the middle here is really where we're gonna find more of the um, kind of single varietal easier drinking versions of Sauvignon Blanc. They're gonna have that kind of grassy herbaceous expressiveness, uh, typically quite green fruit and citrus fruit. Um, and they are very well made, very pleasant wines. Protective wine making here. Um, thinking about something that's gonna have that easy consumer appeal. Um, whereas if we look over to the left bank in Pesek Leonyan in particular, um, it's a very different story. So here is where we have Sauvignon Blanc still, but now we're blended with Semillon. So Semillon does a few things here. Um, it adds to, to the texture, to the weight of the wine. It adds aging potential to the wine. Semillon is a great variety. Uh, it's really quite neutral in its youth. So by blending it with Sauvignon Blanc, you're not detracting from the herbaceous characteristics, but give it a few years and Sauvignon develops more tertiary characteristics. So here we can get things like honey, nuts, dried fruit. 
And this is really the thing that Sauvignon Blanc can't do, as I've mentioned already. So by having the two together, Sauvignon Blanc is not going to lose its flavour for, for a while. I mean, you look at the best Passac Leonian wines, they can last for 10, 15 years, and it holds on to its flavour for that time. But it's the Semillon that brings that capacity for greater development. Um, and then we put it in some oak as well, so we get some of those nice secondary characteristics, maybe some leaves contact as well. Um, and you're seeing a wine that is just the complete opposite to what we'd normally associate with the style of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, the wines are, are delicious, very complex, lots going on. You can still get that kind of, some of those delicate herbaceous or floral characteristics, but it's just in amongst this whole array of other things going on at the same time. Um, so quite a, quite a particular style. Um, but as I've said before, it's not the only place in the world making Oak Age Sauvignon Blancs. It's just one of the places that probably has the best reputation. Um, and then of course, in Sautern is where we see the sweet wine production and uh, so turn in Barsac to be fair and as I've mentioned already here Sauvignon Blanc doesn't really play the major role um, often it's Semillon that's the majority because it's thinner skinned it's more susceptible to noble rot but Sauvignon brings again this kind of vibrancy this tropical herbaceous uh, not so much herbaceous in the sweet wines to be fair um, more floral was what I intended to say instead um, and so turn, you may well know, was historically one of the most highly sought after sweet wines of the world. So, you know, good reputation there. So let's move on and have a think about uh, New Zealand. So after France, Sauvignon Blanc uh, is most widely planted in New Zealand. So we're talking about uh, in terms of hectares planted, um, France still has the most. Uh, New Zealand, second and increasing still. So we may see, no, we're not going to see it catch up. Um, but it's still going. Um, and here we can see Sauvignon Blanc first planted in New Zealand in 1975. And that's, you know, that's kind of mad. That's a really short time to um, essentially change the global wine industry, right? Um, so, uh, pretty impressive. So we'll find vines, um, Sauvignon Blanc vines in a number of places in New Zealand. Uh, Marlborough, of course, is the heat region. So this is where um, the majority of Sauvignon Blanc comes from in New Zealand. Excuse me. Um, so I tried to get some stats here. I believe 89% of Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand is grown in Marlborough. Um, it sounds a bit mad, but we can fact check that later. Um, so yeah, really prolific growth here. And what was discovered was that the style of wine produced in Marlborough um, was different to the style of wine that we had, had experienced in the French wines. So this had this greater ripeness, so we were getting more of these um, stone fruits, even tropical fruits in New Zealand than we would have traditionally found in our French wines. Um, largely due to the greater influence of the sun here. Uh, but the other thing you may remember is that the, the pyrazines, the compounds that give us those um, herbaceous characteristics do are reduced in uh, when the grapes get more sunlight. So we'll find that it's a balance here. And in fact, you might find that many producers grow grapes in different subregions, one that is more sunny, one that's less sunny, or they might try different harvesting times, harvest some grapes a bit earlier, retain more herbaceous notes, harvest some grapes a bit later, get more of those riper fruits. Um, and in that way, we can still maintain that full array of aroma characteristics. Um, so, so yeah, people loved it. Uh, think about, you know, the advent of Cloudy Bay. Uh, it, was, it was a hit and many, many wines followed. So from the 80s, 90s, where the popularity really took an increase, um, it just hasn't really stopped. When I started out in the wine trade many years ago, 
Um, it wasn't a wine that I was particularly familiar with. So I've, I've come from uh, more of a red wine drinking background. Um, and I, I was working in a wine shop and was just astonished at the volume of uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc that would be sold week in, week out. And then you get to Christmas and, oh my God, just like, just leave the pallet by the door. They'll buy a box as they leave. Um, so yeah, it's something that, that made a real impression on me quite early on. Um, and, and as I said, doesn't really show much signs of changing. Um, so it is, it is New Zealand's key grape variety. It's grown in other regions as well. Um, less so on the North Island, uh, just because it does get a bit warmer up there, of course. Um, and it, it's really what's made the, the reputation for the country. And there are other white grapes, of course. You get some lovely Riesling and Gewurz Chaminer and Pinot Gris and Chardonnay. And I'm just listing white grapes now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important and it's going to remain important for a long time. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't any um, changes happening. You know, producers aren't just resting on their laurels, making the same wine year after year after year. Um, there is a focus on complexity, on how can we make wines that are different. Uh, and that's going to come from a lot of the methods uh, that we talked about earlier. So using more wild yeast, using more oak and leaves contact, um, maybe an exp uh, looking at different clonal variations. Um, clonal variation within Sauvignon Blanc doesn't seem to be quite so varied as uh, with some of the other great varieties that we've mentioned. Uh, I tried to find about, out a bit about uh, which clones were better and uh, it was just a list of numbers which didn't really mean anything. But that could be another way to try and understand how to create different styles. So it's, it's gonna be an interesting one to keep coming back to over the next few years to see which producers are making something that does have um, something different to it uh, and what can be done to continue to maintain the popularity. Will there come a point where people have had enough? Um, I was talking to a friend about this the other day and uh, she said she doesn't really drink Sauvignon Blanc. I said, like, oh, well, you know, most popular grape variety. Um, and it's just because it's, she considered it a pub wine. It's just, you know, everywhere sells it. I'm going to try something different. So there may be um, a backlash potentially of the popularity. Um, and this then makes this uh, idea of continuing to work on it, continuing to create more complex styles, even more important so that people have something new that they can go to, something that they've tried before. Um, and I'm always willing to try something new. I'm sure you guys are too. Um, and here we have another just lovely panoramic vineyard shot from Marlborough instead. Um, it's just very pretty. What can we say? Nice, nice neat rows. Uh, good training there. Yeah, all right. A little bit of mention of Australia. Um, so in fact, in terms of um, planting hectares of Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Chile is the third country. There's actually quite a lot produced there, um, but I decided I wanted to talk about Australia instead. Uh, so Australia has been plant, has planted uh, Sauvignon Blanc for a long time, uh, but we do have to be quite careful where it's planted. Uh, as I've already mentioned, it's not suited to growing anywhere too warm. Um, so there's a couple of places uh, in, in the south really, or on the coast or at altitude. So Adelaide Hills um, in South Australia makes some lovely Sauvignon Blanc. Um, here typically single varietal, and here again promoting that sort of uh, vibrant herbaceous aromatic characteristic. In uh, Western Australia, we can see Sauvignon Blanc here. Some single varietal, but also some um, with a bit of semillon in it as well, a little bit more of a nod to the Bordeaux style. 
Um, and then down in Victoria as well, where it's a little bit more uh, further south, a little bit cooler, we'll see some examples there too. Uh, so plantings of Sauvignon Blanc in Australia go back to the 1800s. So it's uh, certainly been planted here a lot longer than it has done in New Zealand. Uh, but they, the kind of original places where the grapes, the vines were planted were just a bit too warm. Um, and so it didn't develop those aromatic characteristics. It didn't develop that complexity. And so the reputation just, just wasn't really there. People didn't realize the potential of it. So as we know in Australia, Chardonnay uh, became uh, particularly popular instead and Riesling. Uh, you may remember if you joined me a few weeks ago for the Riesling session. Um, but as we've said already, trends change. So by the time we get to the 90s, um, it overtook Chardonnay. Um, and this may have been uh, a, a kind of reaction to Chardonnay's big oaky styles, just wanting something a little bit fresher, a little bit lighter, a little bit more easy going. Um, but you can see here there's a bit of a problem. If consumers in Australia are drinking more Sauvignon Blanc, but uh, there wasn't necessarily at the time that many producers making Sauvignon Blanc, uh, it meant that they were actually importing more Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand than they were making, which um, so it's not really what they were hoping for. So it is a, a country where we are seeing um, more Sauvignon Blanc being planted now to, um, to meet this demand, to, to give the consumers what they want. So there are, there are many other regions. Um, it always feels tricky picking out a few. Um, California, I mentioned already, because of that um, kind of Mondavi association, has also been an important region for Sauvignon Blanc, but, but hey, we have to draw the line somewhere. Um, and I really wanted to get in some chat about food. It's nearly dinner time for me. Um, and I think it's, it's always interesting to think about wine with food. As much as you can drink Sauvignon Blanc by itself, it doesn't need food. Um, there are a number of dishes that work really well with it. Um, so I've got given a few examples there. Uh, again, you may have some of your favourites. Feel free to uh, pop them in the chat if there's anything in particular you enjoy with your Sauvignon Blanc. Um, goat's cheese for me, absolute winner. Um, that's one of those um, kind of what grows together, goes together pairings, isn't it? If you think about the cheese in the Loire Valley, we get a lot of goat's cheese, the wine, we get a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. It just works. Um, Goat's cheese having this kind of softer, creamier texture and a bit of acidity works really well with the acidity in the wine. So it just ends up feeling kind of, um, both the cheese and the wine can end up feeling more kind of vibrant and flavorful. Yummy. Um, some more obvious options, uh, shellfish, oysters. Um, I don't think there's any, anyone needs convincing there. Um, you know, think about some nice kind of grilled shellfish. I mean, just fresh oysters, obviously. You don't need to do anything to oysters. Um, Vegetable-based dishes actually can work quite well. Um, if you think about the flavors we've talked about already, um, matching those kind of uh, green pepper, asparagus, green vegetables um, to that flavor in the wine can work quite well, whereas other wines can kind of be a bit overpowered if you've got strong green veg flavors. Um, Likewise, a grilled chicken, delicate, more delicate flavored chicken dishes can work, white meat dishes work, um, or tomato. Uh, often tomato has a nice acidity to it as well. So here again, we're, we're pairing the acidity in the wine with the acidity in the food, and it just brings out a vibrancy in both of them. Um, but then, if we were going for an oak-aged wine, then we would probably do something different. You normally have a bit more texture, more weight with your oak aged wine. So you can go for a food that has more, more texture and weight and flavor to it. So here we might go for some roasted meats, go for a roast chicken or, or a bit of pork, something like that. Um, something a bit more barbecued or char grilled. Creamy dishes. Creamy dishes and oaky wines, uh, as long as the wine has 
in a facility as well, which as I've said a few times, Sauvignon Blanc does, uh, that can work quite nicely. Because um, again, you're getting that sort of contrast of the texture of the, of the cream, that kind of rich viscosity versus the freshness of the acidity, which gives you that sort of mouth cleansing feeling instead. And then for sweet wines, I mean, there's options for sweet wines. Um, blue cheese is my personal favourite. I mean, I could have just put a different type of cheese for every type of wine, to be honest, but I only just refrained. Um, it's quite common. Uh, foie gras, common pairing for Sautern. A um, little bit debatable, I feel. Not everyone likes that or... Um, it depends on the context as well, doesn't it? If you're having, if you were to be, well, depends on your kind of ethical concern as well. If you were to be having foie gras as a starter, I've never really thought it makes sense to have a sweet wine with it because then you'd be moving on to a white wine or a red wine afterwards. But hey, who am I to argue with tradition? And then of course with, um, with desserts. Personally, if I'm having a dessert to go with a, a sweet sauvignon, um, I don't want anything really that's going to be too chocolatey, uh, something that's going to be more fruity, uh, potentially some green fruit, maybe a tart tartan I've put there. Um, what else do I think of? I can't remember now. Um, so again, be selective. If you're going for sweet food with sweet wine, um, think about the flavours that are going to complement uh, is my advice there. So I hope you are all now suitably hungry. Um, and so I just wanted to have a little bit of a, a consideration of the future for Sauvignon. Uh, so the future seems bright, uh, despite my potential concern that people might have enough. I don't think they're gonna have enough. I think it's gonna continue to, to be popular. So plantings are gonna continue to reflect that. Um, but what I will, I think we will see is, as I've said already, this greater variety of styles. So oak I've mentioned a few times, but there are other things. Uh, maybe some more skin contact wines, orange wines. This has become a bit more of a trend in recent years. If this was to become more popular, something that we could see more widespread, I think that would engage more people with Sauvignon Blanc. Um, amphora. Other vessels used for fermentation, you know, it's not just steel or wood. There are other options too. And this again will have a different effect on the, on the texture of the wine, um, which, which is also just a good thing. Um, and in case you weren't aware, there is a Sauvignon Blanc Day. We've missed it this year, sadly. Um, it was on the 7th of May, so as if you guys needed any excuse, but that's, that's the day. Put it in your calendars for next year. Get yourself an extra fancy bottle um, and celebrate your Sauvignon Blanc Day with everyone else. And that brings us to the end. So we've got a, a few minutes if you have any questions. I'll just end the recording here.